Okay, well, we might as well make a start. A few people might be joining us a little bit later, but um, I'd like to firstly thank Jeremy for coming and joining us today to talk about what's happening in the kind of people, food and fiber sector for industry training for um, our industry and about what's been changing at the Workforce Development Council. So um, nine months into the role uh, and has probably a lot of, well, will have a very lot a lot of current information about what's been happening. And so I'll hand over to you, Jeremy. I'm sure you know a few people already, but um, over to you and we'll let you lead the hui. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Jeremy Baker toko ingoa, uh, ko hau te tumuaki mō Mokatangata. Um, I am the Chief Executive, I'm Jeremy Baker, I'm the Chief Executive of Mokatangata, which is the People, Food and Fibre Workforce Development Council. Um, I've got a little presentation which I'll just go through relatively quickly and when that's done um, I'll open it up for any questions that uh, you uh, people in the audience have got. Um, so let me just share my screen. And okay, so um, we are, as I said, a new Workforce Development Council. We are one of six Workforce Development Councils that have been established. And our job is to provide industry, sector, and advocacy within the vocational education system of Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, so we really exist um, to be the industry and sector-led element of the vocational education system. And Mokotangata uh, covers the full range of the food and fibre sector. So we work for agriculture, livestock, uh, horticulture, wine, everything. We pretty much deal with everything that grows uh, and mostly behind the, behind the farm gate, but um, we actually do a little bit of things like wine production and that sort of thing. We work very closely with the other WDCs, in particular the manufacturing WDC and around food manufacturing. Um, what do we do? Well, I could go into a lot of, I won't go into the, the sort of details here, you can, you can read the slides later, but um, basically what we do is we understand uh, what the industry skill needs are we design qualifications um, and standards to meet those needs. And then we give advice to the Tertiary Education Commission on what to fund. So, you know, reasonably crunchy stuff. Um, we also do a whole lot of other things, but uh, including, for example, quality assurance of that delivery. Um, and we obviously work with industry to solve problems, but yeah, that's the, the long and the short of it. Um, a really critical thing that we, we will be doing um, is developing workforce development plans for all of our industries in the food and fiber sector. Um, gathering evidence and insights from talking with our industries and with Hapu and Iwi Māori. We have a very strong focus on Te Tiriti and on uh, Iwi Māori, uh, particularly important in the food and fibre sector given the strong uh, er uh, and resurgent growth of uh, Māori-owned uh, businesses and entities uh, owning land and running Māori agribusinesses in our sector. We then develop clear plans to identify the challenges and opportunities and help us develop those solutions. And those plans underpin our advice to government, as I said, on what to fund, what qualifications to develop, what programs to endorse, and what advocacy and other actions we need to take. And advocacy is pretty important. We're, 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 we're an, an interesting um, form of entity. We are public entities, but not crown entities. Um, we are created by an ordering council under the Education and Training Act. All of our governors are industry people. So the five twelve governors, and they're all uh, food and fibre sector industry leaders. Um, uh, but we're government funded. So it's, a, it's an interesting government industry partnership. Um, we're really focused, um, all six of us, um, on delivering solutions um, because you know, we actually want to make a difference. Uh, and we're really focused on things that will actually make a difference in the short term as well as obviously in the long term. So we'll be giving sol de developing solutions, including advice to industry, uh, the qualifications and standards and micro-credentials, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about micro-credentials a little bit more, uh, shaping the delivery, advice on funding and, and advocacy for change. If we see a policy that's not working for our industry, we will be advocating to get it changed. And I think that's a really important part of what we can do. So what have we done so far? So um, we've been in existence, all of us, uh, for about nine months. Um, as I said, we've been set up as a strong industry lead organization with our 12 governors. Um, we've already done a lot of talking, um, as you can imagine, as well as hiring staff and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we've identified some immediate challenges and opportunities um, that we need to work on. Um, 
frankly, in our sector, there's just the need for more provision generally. Sadly, we've lost uh, a bunch of provision over the last couple of decades. Places like Karatahi um, and some programs offered by other providers have just disappeared. Um, and you know, there's just a real a demand for, for more delivery. But also more flexibility in delivery. Some of the ways it's delivered just don't work for our industries and we, we need to work with training providers to adjust the way that they're doing delivery. There's things like seasonality that are desperately need to be addressed. Um, you know, historically, people have tried to solve that through migration, but you know, that's a bit of a crunch point. Um, whether irrespective of government policy, there's actually a real crunch on, on migra migration globally. Um, but then issues of getting the migration policy settings right, really important. RSC workers um, and other forms of, of, uh, of migration settings are really critical. Um, and there are some specific areas of, which need really hard focus. So sharing is one where there's an absolute real need and forestry safety is another one that's come through. There'll be others. Um, we haven't actually yet begun to fully engage with each individual, individual industry. Uh, we've been working at getting the, the overall picture. Um, but we have already um, identified to the Tertiary Education Commission some, some areas of priority funding. Obviously, we've said increased funding levels. <laughs> we've actually managed to get some of that already. Uh, we managed to get increased uh, funding for workplace uh, training for um, the food and fibre sector. And we were delighted that we managed to get food and fibre into the highest funding category. Um, so that recognises the highly practical nature of the delivery that our industry needs. We've really pushed for a greater use of and funding of micro-credentials, which are a new form of uh, way of actually recognising small bits of learning. They can both be independent, but they can also be chunks that lead towards a qualification. Uh, and we think that's a really important way of helping our sector in particular. And lastly, uh, really important for us, uh, in, increased support for employers. Employers as, as uh, people who need skill development and also people who actually support uh, their own staff to, to develop. Um, and that's a really going to be a really big focus for us in terms of uh, arranging uh, the kind of training we need. We've done some other, another bit of work and we're just kind of coming to the end of it. We've done a really, uh, we commissioned the New Zealand Futures Centre to work with us um, to look at some of the bigger stuff in the food and fibre sector. So it's really actually quite easy for us to hear from industry what the immediate shortages are. They, they tell us loud and clear. Um, but we, if we want to lift people's sights a little bit beyond that, um, we need to actually uh, do a little bit more of a structured approach. So we, we got the, 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 the New Zealand Future Centre to, to work with us on that. We engaged with about 350 people in about 15 regional hui, um, but a mixture of online and, and out in the regions. Um, really pleased that we were able to do that. It's wonderful and, and actually these days an enormous privilege to actually talk face-to-face -face with people. Um, and through that work, we've identified some really big key drivers of change, such as, and I've already mentioned that the significant role of Māori, some really significant demographic changes, and just you know, give you an example, um, the average age in the New Zealand population is, is uh, in the non-Māori population is 44, the average age in the Māori population is 24. And it's just, it's just such a, a striking difference and figure that just demonstrates where the future of our labour market and workforce are. Um, massive environmental challenges um, in, in a sector that is still the driver of the, of the New Zealand economy, you know, with $52.2 billion in the latest year um, and some massive increases, but also significant environmental challenges. This real issue, this tension between volume and value, you know, if you read every government um, strategy, you would assume that we're actually all moving towards value, but actually volume is still a really important part of a lot of our sectors. Um, forestry and the dairy sector are still very volume driven. Um, so it's actually how do we how do we manage that? Um, there is an increasing role of digital and technology, and the key question for a lot of our sector is, well, okay, how do I get it when my broadband's rubbish, um, and those sorts of things. So that's you know a really infrastructure I think is going to become a real challenge um, for us, and something we'll have to focus on. And then the growth of the gig economy is just huge, and it's not just in our sector, but it's everywhere. Um, and just understanding what that means. So those are just some of the big drivers. Where, where are we taking all of this? Um, so we've done, we're, we're sort of in the process of developing an initial sector-wide workforce development plan based on all of that conversation. It really is going to be a, a draft. It's going to be a conversation starter as, as well as that um, Food and Fibre Futures report. Um, that will that will guide the conversation we go out and have with about 14 industry groups. And we're going to be really sitting down with each of them and going, what are your, what are your, 
both longer term and immediate challenges and opportunities. And for each of them, we'll then be going, okay, so what are the priority actions that we and you need to take um, across all of those things I've already talked about um, that we can actually help you um, get some, some wins um, in, the, in the short order? I mean, we're pretty realistic. We're new entities. Um, we're, we're, some people are going, well, what are you for? We're really, really focused on delivering value in the short term, as well as obviously shipping. By, by definition, we're a long term. Uh, focused entity, but we have to deliver some value in the short term. I think that's probably enough um, of, a, of, a, of an overview. Hopefully it gives you enough to kind of um, maybe ask some questions um, about, you know, what is this thing, Mokotangata? So kia ora. Hopefully that was helpful. Kia ora. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, incredibly helpful. I did have a couple of questions. So um, I guess one mm -hmm. of them is where is the responsibility for kind of marketing this sector to potential employees or people that want to grow careers in, in our sector? Where does that sit? And um, I guess, how do we ensure that we're attracting the right people into the training opportunities? Mm -hmm. So we have a, we have a role in there, but we're not we're not fundamentally a, a, a sector marketing agency. Um, but interestingly, we have commissioned some work um, from Primary Purpose um, to actually go around and interview um, all of the, some of the key leaders in the sector to understand. And really, what we're trying to understand there is the balance between how much people think it's important to promote the whole of the food and fibre sector versus promoting their individual industries. And from we're also asking them the really hard question, how much are you prepared to invest in each of those respectively? Um, and then we need to understand how does what we do versus what the Tertiary Education Commission with Careers NZ, uh, what they're doing versus what MPI is doing with Opportunity Grows Here. And we want to tie all those bits together um, and we want to add value on top of that. There is one area where we, we absolutely have uh, responsibility and that is making sure that the standards uh, and, and, and opportunities within the senior secondary school um, for agricultural primary and, and other forms of education training actually are suitable uh, and attractive for people in senior secondary to then stay, uh, you know, um, follow a, a, a ladder through into further study. So that, that's something we will absolutely take responsibility for. But what we want to understand is where, there's a, where is there a gap beyond that where we can play a role um, we're not funded, for instance, to do a big marketing campaign. So that's that's some, that's not what we're going to try and do. MPI is currently doing that. But what we want to understand is where are the gaps? How do we connect up what industry is doing with what um, we're doing with what we got other government agencies are doing? Hopefully that helps clarify that. Yeah, very much. So you touched on um, some of the big challenges for the industry and the training around climate change. but um, mm -hmm. And you've talked a little bit about... Um, uh, bringing in more Māori into the sector and the ageing, uh, mm -hmm. the population age. I was just wondering, mm -hmm. um, where does Mataranga Māori sit in the work that you're doing? Because mm -hmm. uh, we had a speaker last week from Ag Research yep. um, who was talking about yep. Mataranga Māori from that perspective. So how is that mm -hmm. working in your organisation? Um, yeah, no, Mataranga, so, so first, as, as I mentioned, um, te ao Māori um, and responding to te kiriti issues and Crown Maori relations is, is central to what we do. So we're very focused on ensuring that the Māori agribusiness sector is able to flourish extremely well within uh, within our sector. Um, the interesting thing of Mataranga Māori within education, um, it, it also it goes way beyond us as well. So NDQA um, is also engaged in, in trying to understand what, what its role is in, in that area, and frankly, so are the universities. Um, the really interesting challenge is that you want to recognize and enable and validate Mataranga Māori without claiming ownership and control over it, because essentially Mataranga Māori is owned fundamentally by every hapu and iwi. Um, it's not something generic to, to Māori, and it's not something that you want to be owned by the national qualification system. So the, the, it's, it's this really interesting challenge. To me, it's actually not, it's a, it's a specific example of a broader challenge that I, I, I'm very committed to, which is enabling all of our qualifications and standards and micro-credentials to recognise diversity and, and, and difference. That individual learners, individual employers actually you know, there, there might be a set of common things that everyone agrees we all need to learn this, but this employer is going to go, mm, I want to do it this way. And these are some things that, and, and I want that training to be built into my training program. We need to recognize and validate that 
but not necessarily say that everyone has to do that. And I think if we can if we can solve that problem and the problem around how we both recognise and validate Makarama Māori without going, well, okay, now we need to codify it and put it on a, on a national qualifications framework, uh, we will have done benefits for both, for everybody, really. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. I was just wondering if Esther or Gerhard have any questions they would like to put to you. Otherwise, I could question you all day. Um, like they might not. Um, I did have a question about grass. So mm -hmm. I remember very specifically, there was a long conversation about where grass sits in the Workforce Development Councils, because um, right. I know the sports turf people have, I, I guess they could call it a turf war. So if you're thinking, <laughs> if you're thinking well, about, um, you know, like the, yeah. the kind of responsibility and remit of what goes into food and fibre and what goes into transport yeah. and what goes into, I don't know, other... Recreation, other recreation and sport, yeah. Yeah. How, how have you managed that with your colleagues working in other sectors? Yeah. So one of the really awesome things about how we set up the Workforce Development Councils, and this wasn't necessarily a requirement from day one, although it does say in the legislation we have to collaborate. Um, but what we have actually agreed to do when, during the setup process, we actually agreed to share all of our offices, to share all of our back, uh, back office services. So we have a shared services company that provides our IT, our HR, all that sort of stuff. And we have a lot of shared um, work programs and approaches, um, but across the WDCs. So whilst we're all each got our own sectors and our own areas of responsibility, we're, they're actually all, there are lots of overlapping areas like that. So sports chief is one, um, food manufacturing is another, IT or technology. I mean, you know, we've got one WDC that's focused on technology, but all of us are interested in how technology is playing across our industries. So we, we've made a very strong commitment and we are working extremely closely together and have not just done that, we're actually building systems in uh, that mean that it kind of shouldn't matter um, where grass, I mean, grass is going to fit in multiple places. So is management, so is you know, there, there are some common skill sets and, and issues that cross. What matters is, is the industry being heard? Uh, are the employers and learners getting what they want? And have the training providers got clarity about what they need to deliver? Um, that's how we're focusing rather than you know, which box it fits in. Okay, so I've got one more question and then I'll let you get back to your day. Um, no and it was about, so a couple of years ago, I saw Shamobile Equib talking about um, the rural uh, living in rural areas and basically saying, yep. you know, in rural areas, you have worse outcomes for housing, you have worse outcomes for access mm -hmm. to doctors and schools. And um, so how much does that affect the sorts of things that you're making recommendations to government about knowing that um, when young people are coming in or people are coming into training in this sector, that there's going to be a whole bunch of things that are disbenefits of working in this area, as well as a whole bunch of things that are benefits probably not an easy yeah. one, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I guess, um, I, I'll, I'll answer that by saying what we're gonna do in terms of, of trying to tackle those, those broad issues. Um, we're gonna focus on all of the issues to do with the labor. So while, whilst we, our, our, our formal powers, if you like, relate to vocational education and training, the name workforce development in our title for it means quite a lot to us and we're going to take a broad view of what are all of the challenges and opportunities for our sector so certainly for our sector the issue of um you know the infrastructure and, and i mean hard and soft infrastructure and that is a barrier to um, workforce and skill development or just, or just having people in our regions you know whether there's sufficient housing whether there's um uh, uh, you know, schools available and other forms of infrastructure. If that's a real problem, we will be talking about it. Um, and we won't necessarily, it's not just our, our job to fix it, but we will be drawing attention to it. I mean, it may not be our job to fix it, but I'll tell you what, we're going to be having a damn good go at putting the, the people whose job it is to fix it in touch with our industries and trying to broker a deal. Um, so, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. There's just a comment from Gerhard. Gerhard, did you want to talk to this? Can I Can I actually talk? Yep, please do. Uh, sorry. Hi, um, Jeremy. Um, there, there's a big push towards mechanisation. Um, and although there's a, 
this is a good thing. It also seems to me that it can be a negative thing. For example, if you start excluding RSE workers, you are negatively impact those, uh, impacting those economies in a way. And I just want to find out if I'm looking at it through the wrong lens. Should I say, look, let's upskill those workers? Or should one say, well, we mechanize and we're benefiting, let's say, our primary industries? I just I just want to find out, like, mm. I feel like my lens is wrong and I might misinterpret how I'm viewing this. And it would be good to know how you view that and, and kind of not necessarily maybe manual laborers or lower wage workers like they are very important to still have yeah, their yeah. What's yeah. The future of that well i think there are always many there's a complex answer there's no simple solution to, to you know no simple answer to one answer to that um sometimes um, mechanization results in displacement but actually it's generally displacement of a, of a particular form of work rather than displacement of jobs most of the literature says it shows that actually a mechanization actually results in more jobs ultimately but i guess the point you're making is that certain people with certain skill sets um no longer have have work um there are two two responses to that one not everything can be mechanized even if you want it to be and secondly mechanization is costly and sometimes and requires having the right infrastructure if you don't have really good internet you can't do some of the mechanization that's available um in terms of rsc workers that's a really really important area for our industries to to, to really focus on and we really want to work really closely with both industries and with government uh, with with MB on getting the policy settings right. I, I'm particularly interested, for instance, in ensuring that there is training available for REC workers in New Zealand while they're here, and that that training is relevant back in their home countries. Because REC scheme is not just an, a migration scheme; it's also actually an uh, a, a an, an aid an aid or economic development scheme for the Pacific. And we need to, you know, there is a, there's a, tra a treaty that we have across the Pacific called PACER Plus, which is about uh, skill and qualification recognition uh, across the Pacific. We need to ensure that the training that the RSC workers get in New Zealand while they're here is, is not only recognised, but also useful when they go home. Um, and so that's that's a quite exciting um, project that I'm very committed to. Um, so it, it's like like everything, you had, it's always both end. Um, how do you, how do you um, transition to uh, more productivity, sometimes that's more mechanization, but frankly, there are also going to be some things that just require that that, that personal and human touch. Uh, and then you, you say, okay, well, how do you maximize the the productivity of those people and the return? And if you're talking about something like REC, how do you make sure that the benefit accrues both to New Zealand and to the REC workers and to the countries they came from? Awesome. Thanks. That really answers my question. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll call the hui to a close, but I'm sure if anyone's got any follow-up questions, they can get in touch with with you, or um, and I'll share the presentation with our members that couldn't join us today. Yep, that's wonderful. Um, I'm just putting my email address um, in the chat, so um, please feel free to email me. Um, uh, I will pass you on. Um, I'll have a chat initially 